All right, we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, let's see. Uh, first is to set the agenda. Uh, looks like we just have to add an um, LEMP approval. Um, yep. Local emergency management plan, municipal adoption form. So do you want to do it after the stipulation agreement at the very end? Yeah, we're just going to put it at the bottom of the agenda. Yep. We have to have it done by May 1st, so. And Great. sent to Two Rivers. Anything else to add? Not that I'm aware of. I just need a... Um, Approve as amended? Yeah, you got it. Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 We are short two board members tonight. I thought Paul was going to jump on. He may still. Um, just keep an eye on him. I know Jordan's traveling, so he won't be available tonight. But we do have enough for a quorum. So um, our first appointment is Dubois and King. Uh, yep. Six o'clock. So we're um, just going back to our options in regards to the Pleasant Street sidewalk project. Um, at the last meeting, we had um, uh, kind of three options laid out in front of us uh, based upon either doing all the walls, um, the wall that's leaning, or and then we kind of asked about no wall at all because uh, budget wise so they have come back to us with the options um some updates for those so that and i gave you the explanation um chris had uh, so hi chris hi Rita. Hey. thanks for joining so chris had given us one of the things we talked about was a tie back so um i included chris's explanation about about that so we removed the tie back option and so then they provided us with the construction cost estimates. And so I was looking back after Chris had asked me a question. So we have 172,359 coming out of our grant already for two rivers for municipal management and um, engineering. So these prices don't include that, correct? That is correct. And there was a talk at the, well, it wasn't last meeting, a couple meetings ago about the possibility of getting additional funds. And I know Reed and I were just talking today about a separate bike ped grant. Would it be an amendment to this one, Rita, or would we have to reapply to for so, like the uh, V Tran uh, has an option for um, I guess you could say uh, requesting for additional funds yep. on existing projects. Uh, the caveat is that the town would have needed to demonstrate you've cleared right of way, have the right of way certificate so that you're basically construction ready. Um, and so um, we would obviously need um, updated construction estimates to illustrate sort of like, you know, showing the case of why we need the extra funds um, in the grant application. But yeah, that can, I can help with that. Um, Is there a but, deadline? deadline for that Rita um because of where we're at with this phase we have not cleared right of way uh, right. we may think about um, pursuing additional funding requests for next year or the next round okay Chris well, Chris kind of agrees, but at least you know now that after today we'll probably have um, a preferred option to move forward with and right. then Du Bois and King can kind of move forward to kind of refine um, everything, um, put it through right of way. Once we get the certificate, he'll get a final um, updated cost estimate. And when the grant is open, um, we can put in for the additional funding request. And once that is awarded, because VTrans does want to see these projects completed um, and understand with, with costs and inflation kind of wrecking havoc with budgets as best as we plan for it um they will you know most likely um award what is usually you know our additional request we'll have the right away so that basically all we have to do is like go to construction because we have the right of way we're ready to go. And so we won't be like wasting any more time with, you know, any redesign, like, you know, we're ready to go, so. Right, and would the additional funding be minus? So the match, um, 
the match will be included in that calculation. So like in, in the ask, right? So if we're asking for, you know, 125,000 total, then um, whatever the 80% is will be the, the award amount. Right, okay, excellent. All right, thank you. Yeah. So did you want Chris, so Chris, you're obviously, we're at no wall repair, wall repair, right? But it's still that, just that 40 foot section. Yeah, and I I misspoke a little bit. There is a 40 foot section, but um, it's about 18 feet in from the beginning of the wall. So likely we would probably do the first 58 feet. So that's what's included in the cost estimate. Okay. So did you have any uh, things you wanted to point out to them? I mean, I feel like you've probably gone over everything so far, but. I, I had okay. slides that I'm not allowed to share here, but uh, I don't know that we need to go through them. <laughs> that's, okay. that's completely up to you. Yeah, wait, so, I mean, you did them before, but the question is, um, so updated construction costs, those are based on the um, updated, like are they VTRANS numbers or how do you? Yeah, we, we put them in through the it's IPD web is the is the yeah. software that they use. And, um, and then we also compare those to, you know, current projects that have gone out to bid as well as the two year averages. So we do the best we can to keep the numbers current. Right. No, that makes sense. All right. And I believe the numbers this time do include, um, I think last time, they did not include the rectangular you know, rapid flashing beacons, as okay. well as the others, um, the east. I guess that is the, correct. The, the other side of the sidewalk. It was about 120 feet that we hadn't included previously that's in this as well for, for both okay. numbers, yeah. Excellent, all right, that's right, thank you. Well, I think I think the challenge that we have right now is not knowing what we may may or may not get for extra money on top of what we currently have is the way I see it right now is doing the repair to the wall, that 58 foot section of wall, based upon what we're going to need for or have used or will need for engineering and management that only leaves us a balance of $356,000, um, which doing the small wall repair, we'd have to come up with an extra $200,000 for the project. And I guess the no wall saves you almost 100,000, um, but would still be $110,000 over, mm -hmm. over our costs. So, I mean, if, I guess it would be an easy decision if we knew that the state was gonna give us $200,000 more, then it, I guess the no brainer is to fix the wall, right? Um, but not knowing what the state may or may not give us for extra funds, it, we have to kind of assume that that difference is going to be made up locally at this point. Have you had um, any historical situation with that, Rita? Have you seen what have they been consistent in the past when people ask that you're aware of or, or don't you know? Um, so I just finished managing the Heartland Three Corners project. Um, <laughs> Boy. We 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 did request additional funding. Um, I believe we asked for one hundred twenty five thousand um, for additional funding, um, which was granted. Um, so I think I think I don't know if you know the budget is kind of the budget um, in terms of the funding for VTrans. I think. I think as long as we demonstrate um, sort of the need and the reasons why the original budget application, the, the difference and um, like you can see the unforeseen circumstances and obviously with the costs of construction, um, we can kind of um, hit on those points to kind of make the case that um, this piece is important for um, ADA accessibility and improvement to um, pedestrian, you know, walkability in town. So we go ahead. So basically, it's a we go ahead and and we go for the 
the wall repair, the 556,500, and then we appeal and we get some of the extra money or we don't, if we don't get everything we want, we, at that point, we still, we can't cut the project back, right? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't think I've run into that before. Yeah. And we always knew like the wall, uh, Therese, as when we first put this grant application and we knew the wall was going to be sort of this unknown factor um, mm -hmm. going forward, um, not knowing how big of an impact it would be to this sidewalk project. It's um, true, and to make that apparent in the grant application, we kind of said, you know, there's this wall, but we obviously didn't know the, his, you know, history behind right. it. Right, and the overall project is not contingent upon the wall. It's just, you know, a side factor that we right. obviously would like to um, improve on. So I think, um, you know, Tom, budgets are important. Um, yeah. And I think we, we can make the case for that. And if, um, you know, that's all we can do and VTrans will make the decision and whatever decision they make, we will, um, if we need to like reconsider our scope based on that, then it's always easier to kind of reduce after we get all of our permits, right? Like the, the area of impact. Perfect. So if we need to cut the okay. wall repair out, then. Yeah. All right. So be it. We'll have to do that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So I just want to quickly just catch Paul up because he just jumped on. Um, so Paul, we're talking about the Pleasant Street sidewalk project. Um, so we have to uh, make a decision this evening on either go with the, the small wall repair of about 58 feet of wall with that project or to do no wall repair at all. And what we've been talking about right now is the, we lose them? No. Okay. Is, is the cost component of it. So right now our grant is $530,000. That includes our match. No. And the engineering slash management piece of it is about 174,000. So, so our balance right now is $356,000. And the option for the wall repair, it's 556,000. Uh, and then the no wall repair is um, 468,000. So to do the wall, we, we potentially would have to come up with an extra $200,000 for that project. To do the non wall piece of it, we'd have to come up with approximately $100,000 more. Uh, there is a chance that we can potentially get some more grant money, but it's not given. And we don't know how much that may be. So, um, but we could make that application and, and as Rita was just saying, make the application and then <clears throat> we could always cut the scope of the project back if we have to. But there's a, there's a chance that doing the sidewalk without the wall repair might compromise the wall uh, during that process. We would definitely want to call for some type of shoring up of the wall by the contractor when he is excavating out to install the sub base and the new concrete. So well, that's a minimal chance that something will happen or? That, that's something I was going to su maybe suggest is if, if we're walking away from doing any type of wall design, you know, overall the walls no. that perhaps we should have one of our structural guys come out and just take a you know a look at it and make a re recommendation on is is this sound or or what are the chances of either a failing now or b failing under construction okay It'd be kind of sad not to do it considering we that was one of the whole things about was to make it more ada accessible to do the wall but yeah, plus the leaning factor, you know, that it leans into the sidewalk and it takes away a certain amount of inches of yep. passage. Absolutely. So yeah. in, for, in for a penny, in for a pound. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Paul. Yeah. So I guess at this point, what the board has to decide is which option we want to go with. Um, and then at least at this point, that, that extra potential cost would be a local match. Um, that hopefully maybe we can offset with some more grant funding, but we won't know that. So, um, I don't know, Denise, your opinion on it? I vote for um, the 3A to go with the wall repair. 
With the wall? With the wall repair, yeah. Okay. Dave? Is this really repair or replace? Replace. 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 That, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, I'm, I'm keep reading this and looking at the drawing, I say, wow. That's a lot of repair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah. sorry. Replace that. Okay. I'm, I'm for me. What the hell? It's only money. But <laughs> but why spend four hundred thousand dollars and do a job that's going to be done in five years or possibly five fifty six, mm -hmm. and I'll never see it have to be done again. Right. Right. Okay. Construction cost will go up. And Plus, with under this grant, it's you know it's eighty percent. Reimbursed. Exactly. So. Right. Now, if it falls apart later, then we're on the hook for everything. Paul. Yeah, I agree. Let's go with the uh, the wall uh, replacement. Okay, and I know I know Jordan's not here tonight. When I talked to him, he was in favor of also going with the wall repair as long as the budget wise was similar <laughs> i'm going to say that this is not very similar on the budget end of things but i know he was in favor of the wall repair um so it sounds like we have a majority of uh wall repair votes so we'll go with that option all right did you guys need anything else from the select board no one one thing i didn't hear though was one other cost associate would be the uh construction inspection firm during construction it, was that factored in to anything yeah it was that was in the budget as well the okay. construction yep. inspection yeah okay. yeah well, i contracted with um with uh, two rivers so it'll be rita for, for no the during during oh. uh yeah the, yes, yes, Chris, that, that cost was factored into the original grant budget. Okay. So the cost of the, the, the request for additional funding will just be for construction, I believe. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you guys for joining. Appreciate it. Okay. Great, thank, a, you. thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Great, so that one's done. Any further discussion on that? Okay, you're nine. Uh, we're only two minutes late on you, Geo, but um, Geo is here from the town of Royalton, so welcome, Royalton. Um, they are in the process of reclassification talk, discussion of yeah, so, Perm uh, Road. So we're, we're I'll pass this around. You guys can take a look at that. Um, TH21 is the one I want to talk about. That's the Royalton thing. So what we've done in Royalton is we decided to come up with a plan for our class. How about you look at this picture and see if you agree before we go on? Okay. Yeah. As I talk, I'll look at it, Dave. So we're coming up with a plan to deal with our class four roads. Some of these roads are still passable. Some are, people don't even know where they are. The state had it listed wrong on the map. And it's all over the place. Um, and we, once a month, we went out on the road, uh, invited anybody who wanted to come. We'd have 15 to 20 people who would come out with us. Nice. People were really interested in the roads. And then at the end of the um, walk, we'd say, what do you want to do with this road? We can throw it up. We can keep it as a road. We can make it into a, a legal town trail. And the ones that were passable, people said, keep them as class four roads, uh, the ones that were unpassable, uh, no one said throw them up. They all said, let's make it a legal trail. And that's where you guys come in because we actually share one. Uh, it's TH21 in Royalton. It comes out of Waterman Road, the dump road. Um, and right almost at the end of Waterman Road where it merges in with Morse Road and Route 14. And then it goes over into Bethel um, right towards, well, across Bob Dean's property somehow. <laughs> yeah, Perm. Yeah, and then it becomes Perm Road and then joins Christian Hill. Yeah. Um, and when we walk that road, our, our side of the road's pretty cool. Um, it's got sunken roads, stone walls. Uh, everybody liked it, easily passable, except for the first part. There. Um, yeah. <laughs> the last time I was on this, you couldn't walk through. Yeah, you could, you could walk through there. All the, all the way. Someone's, someone's cut some shit out of there. Yeah, no, you could, you, can, you could drive through there, except for the first part of the road at Waterman. It's too steep. Um, 
And uh, and it's, it's kind of cool, too, when you get to the Royalton Bethel Town line, you know where it is, because I guess there was a boundary just a few years ago. And they did a survey, uh, like turn of last century, and they've got granite markers, R on one side, B on the other. So it's kind of neat to see that. Um, and, uh, nice fence line right there, too. Yep. And so it's, it's, it's kind of a neat road. And what we would love to do is, since now we have a school in common, we would love to make it into the Wildcat Trail, make it into a legal trail. Um, and that, that's a designation that the select board would have to, to make. Um, it requires a site visit, uh, a public hearing site visit. Uh, um, and the work that needs to be done on the Royalton side, uh, we figure we haven't approached the school yet, but all the athletic teams have to put in a certain amount of um, uh, community service time. And the Upper Valley Trails Alliance will help us and, and manage uh, a cruise, and we think we can get this done with very little money. So we're interested in um, finding out what if you guys want to partner with this on this. And I think, from what I understand in talking to Dave, we're a little uncertain. I'm uncertain where the road exactly is. That's where the road is. Side. That road is right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the that's the Royalton side. The Bethel side is where we're uncertain. Well, it's pretty. It's there's a hedgerow right across yep. there. The whole thing right there. This, okay. From this here to there, where this field comes up, yep. if you can't see that, I mean, that's a very, very designated road. And then there's a head, yep. the hedgerow all the way across yep. up to their property up here. Uh, it's a little wet right there, but... Uh, where's, yeah. where's the Dean house? It's right, right there, there, right? Yep, okay. that's where I thought it was, too. So but at I, what point in the process are you right now, Geo? So we had a, we had a task force that was basically a subcommittee of the planning commission. Um, they've made the recommendation. That's what I passed around. You guys can keep that. Um, that is, so it's now at the planning commission. So the planning commission is reviewing that. Once we're done with it, then it goes to the select board. Um, there's been this, I imagine it's gonna go through. I don't, the select board's in the loop and uh, no one seems to be resistant. We'll probably have some public hearings on our side. Um, but there's quite a few roads that would change from roads into legal trails. If you make it a legal trail, I should explain this, that it doesn't mean you can't in the future make it back into a road. So it doesn't mean that you can't reverse yourself at some point in the future. Because what you're doing is keeping the easement, you're just changing the nature of it. Right now, if you keep it a, a class four road, you can't control uh, who wants to quote unquote drive on it. Anybody can drive on it unless you've got to post it because of mud. Now, once you unpost all your other roads, you got to unpost it. And if someone wants to try to drive on it, they can. If you make it a legal trail, you can actually control who goes on the road in terms of, you could say, um, bicycles, uh, horses, pedestrians are fine. No, no, no motor vehicles, none whatsoever. So you, you have the ability to actually control more of what happens if you, if you make it into a trail. Since you're... We're hoping we're actually just talking, uh, Brian and Cecil, and you know we have a class four road committee that lost three members um, in fairly close succession. So it could be something that if the select board wanted, they could ask the class four road committee to take a look at and for their recommendation, um, they need to, we kind of need to get them revitalized and working. If that would, could be an option for the select board if you wanted to. What is, what is that section used for currently? I mean, I know it's, it's a class four road, but is there hiking or ATVing or snowmobiling? What, what's going on in that stretch of road now? Um, to, to my knowledge, it's a, uh, one of the landowners is using it sort of as a farm lane and to get back to his woodlot. Um, I know of no other use for it. Um, the snowmobile trail travels a short distance. Yes, I, I, thank you, Dave. That's right. The snowmobile trail is on it for just a vast trail for a short distance. It's the Royalton side's very clear. Uh, once you cross over into the Bethel side and you get to uh, uh, there's a meadow right before uh, Dean's house, um, then it, it becomes it's pretty obvious where I thought where the road was, but it's all a meadow. It's completely meadow. There's no sign that anybody's ever going along it. How close does it come out near Dean's house? Right into his 
right into his right to his house, right through oh. his driveway. That's right, that right class, up to the driveway. That's okay. class three. <laughs> I believe that's class three down to it is, your house. yeah. I gave put a map in your packet. Yeah, so it, it's class, class three. four actually comes uh, yep. up to the edge of his garage. And, okay. And talking to the, the folks from the Upper Valley Trails Alliance, they say this is the type of trail that if we built this, hmm. it's not going to get 75 people a day. It's not right. going to get 75 people a week. Mm -hmm. um, it's mostly going to be used by the neighbors. Um, but it's it's such a cool resource once you start walking these people w once people know where they're at and you can you like we post it and say mm -hmm. here's where it's at um, here's how you get to it you'll you'll find that people will walk up mm -hmm. now and then so he the, the guy estimated 10 to 15 people a week yeah okay like I said my that would be my recommendation is send it to the class four road committee just to have them walk it do a little research they could make a then they could make a recommendation to you about what you wanted to do yeah i mean i i well i'd be i'd love to come with them when yeah. they do that yeah we got it so how much time together. do you think you have right now geo before you take your next step oh uh months okay okay perfect we're not there's the clock's not super ticking on this okay yeah no i think that probably be the um the best thing at this point is to there's a gate you have the fourth class road committee look at this that's gone yeah. Oh, Paul's waving his hand. Sorry, Paul. There was a little glare. No, you said that they'd lost three members. Do we still have a four, fourth, <laughs> fourth class road committee? Currently, it's um, Derek Aldrigetti, Chris Fors, and uh, Alex Reister. But I was just talking tonight to Brian Wright and Cecil Washburn because they're both here and they'd be willing to um, to join. Obviously, both have a lot of history. Um, so it would be you got to revitalize the committee to see who wants to stay on and maybe they could, could recruit a couple other members, but. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Well, I guess does that sound like what we want to do. Yeah. Sorry, we'll turn it over to the fourth class back. road committee to, to look at on the Bethel side and, and, um, do we want to establish a time to meet back so that so that we we get it moving in the direction and well, i think it's largely in when the the, the this class four road committee can meet so i think it's kind of in their hands all right well I'll put an email out to them tomorrow and see <clears throat> and then they can you know figure out who you know when they want to meet and that sort of thing so yeah. can, can get you, them can get you them um have, make sure they contact me absolutely when they get together so yep we'll... yep i'll make a note CC great thank you want to be in the loop <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a question. Hey. And um, are you sure it's not used for anything else like snowmobiles? No, we we they did say it's, it's there's a just a short, part of it is short, a fast track. Short small, small segment. segment. And when, in our plan, we have other class four roads that are being used as fast trails. We have no intention of prohibiting um, snow machines, but fast trails in um, our trails. From from using our legal trail, we can we can permit any kind of things we want, and we don't have any um, problems with uh, snow machines on the trails. What about um, ATVs? It's illegal to have ATVs on them because ATVs are illegal on roads in Vermont. I mean, in royalty. So anybody who's riding an ATV currently on one of those Class Four roads is doing it illegally right now. Because you're not supposed to have them on a uh, on a road in roads. Right. Now, just to be clear, make sure I know what I'm talking about. Snow Machine Trail never touches Royalton's proposed trail. This is a Bethel Royalton line. Yeah. It comes down in, out through that meadow and it takes about, oh, I see it. about 100 yards. That's where it verges as soon, off. As soon as it comes yeah. by, right by your line, it yep. breaks through the woods and goes down. The road. Yep. So right now, the snow machine trail does not go on your right. property. Even if it did, we, we'd be okay with it. Yeah, it looks like it crosses right. Yep. Uh, Dave, I think that got changed from what you remember. Well, I, I got a map. You have a map? I'm so, looking at the map. We do go towards Frankie Benson's on the town road in Royalton. And so come out in the field now. 
So we don't we don't go across. We don't go all the way through the woods and come out on the other we side. We don't go across that bridge in the woods. It's we abandoned the bridge because of the bridge failed. Royal and they want to put a new bridge in, so they go on the town road now. All right, well, we need to. That's probably why that road is clear. That's why that road is clear. All the way, and it goes almost to Frankie Benson. Yeah. Takes a right out into the field, um, and then they use the field now all the way to Waterman Road. So wherever this map came from, so it's not up here. I got off E nine one one. Like I said, it's not going to be a problem with us. We're fine. The best. Yeah, the reason, see, that's Royalton and Bethel may take over Royalton. Bethel stormed up, stormed up in Bethel may take over Royalton. Right now, Royalton has, is up in the air whether they're going to, I don't believe they're still in business. So, so Bethel took over all that. But I do know I cleared that road all the way to Frank, almost to Frank's Okay. Well, those are all clear that we can work out, you know, if you decide. Yeah, to know that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, that's great. That's yeah. good information. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me over. Yeah. Thanks for thinking thanks about the time. You. Getting the ball rolling on this. Thank you. Look forward to. Yeah, I would say yeah. it's probably be, what, a couple months out from probably, probably getting out. Yeah, yeah. I'll send them an email. Tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that, not a problem. So we'll follow back up in June with you. We'll yeah. kind of let you know how things are going. Yeah, that's great. Great. Okay. Sounds great. good, Gio. 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 Yeah. Gio. Maybe we'll just look back. Yeah, first go to the, yeah, go to the committee first. Okay. Well, if he goes with him, he'll also know where they stand. So good. All right. All right. Uh, hey, we're still right on time. We have a uh, Bethel TV Club. Mr. Manning. <laughs> Uh, my name is Richard. I'm here tonight with some other fellow members of our club. Uh, we're seeking permission again to be able to use some of the town roads for our trail system. Uh, we do have one proposed change that we'd like to discuss. Uh, last year, we lost some property on the Randolph side of Camp Brook Road in the Charlie Wilson area. So we're not able to go over there anymore. We're currently in the process of working with a landowner to be able to go from Paul's Peak Road to Cantdell Road and then back up over the hill that way to get over on the Hooper Hollow side of the hill. We're still in the early stages of that, so we would also like to see if we could use uh, Dart Hill Road from approximately Paul's Peak Road down to the Four Corners and then go up Cantdell Road to the Bryant Road um, to be able to connect those two portions of the trail there um, until we can get the other stuff up and running. That would at least let us to be able to get going until we can get the other trail in place. How much distance? I have the map here that was on in the office, the 26.2 miles I put in the packet. I can see, obviously, Charlie Wilson and Dart. How much are you talking about when you want to go from Paul's Peak to the Four Corners on Dart? How? What's the mileage? Down to the Four Corners. I'm not really sure what the exact mileage is on that right now. Um, and then from the four quarters, we would go up Camp Bell Road uh, to Bright Road. And I'm not really sure what the mileage is for that. Either. You get a quarter of a mile from the church. Put it during the hill up to the Bryan Road. So you think you're talking a quarter mile on Dart and then how far on Camp Bell? After you come off a of Dart Hill and get on to the Camp Bell Road. Yep. That's a quarter of a mile. That's a quarter of a mile. Okay. I don't know. And I don't believe, I don't think it's half a mile off a of dark hill. Okay. So it might be three quarters of a mile to a mile. And you're hoping it's just a temporary. Yeah, until we can work with this other landowner to get um, from Paul's Peak Road over to Camp Bell and then get everything in place for that. But at least if we can use that portion for now, like I say, it'll let us get up and running, let some people ride, give us some more time to get the, the other segment going. Uh, we'll take care of, you know, all of our signage, obviously, to, so everybody knows where they're going and try to keep everybody doing the same speeds and that kind of stuff. I know VAST had a, has an app for like GPS. Does the ATB use the VAST app? Or? Yeah, most of VAST is all connected with the uh, Players Ride Command app, so yeah. in the areas where you, where you go to ride, you can pull it right up on your phone or tablet or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. 
And that's one of the things, if we get approval tonight for that, we'll have to have VASA come in to remap everything for us so that we can get that onto that right command app as well. So, so we'll this, have that as well as our signage. All right, so if the select board approves it, then you guys would um, give us an updated map to keep it. Yeah, once we get it mapped out officially again and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, yeah. And then once we do get going with VASA this summer, uh, we'll be working with them as far as having some law enforcement around again. Um, having somebody at the trailhead checking registration, that kind of stuff. Nice. Um, if we're still using this section of Dart Hill and Cantor Road, we can have somebody sit up at the four corners for a while, making sure nobody's speeding and everybody's wearing helmets and all that stuff. Yeah, you can also reach out to the sheriff's department and let them know when you make the change. And I'm sure they can. Yeah, it's typically who they work with is mm -hmm. local sheriff's department as well as local game wardens. So. Mm -hmm. Anything, Denise or Dave on the There he is. He's back. Paul, any thoughts on the ATV Club's uh, proposal on using a, a piece of um, Campbell and Dart Hill to? Well, I just think, uh, you know, there'd be speed considerations for the local residents there to make sure that um, the ATVs you know, no, are there speed signs that are posted or anything like that? So um, folks will be aware of, of uh, what the speed speed limits are in that, in that three quarters of a mile or mile. So Richard, go ahead, Richard, sorry. Yeah, we will have signs up posting speed limits and stuff. Um, typical speed for ATVs is 25 miles an hour. Um, we do know there are some houses that are in kind of close proximity to the road. So we can kind of label those as a sensitive area. We can even drop the speed limit down a little bit lower. I thought it was 15 when you go by houses in one. Uh, it depends. Some are, some of the trail systems are 15 and some places lose 25. But yeah, we can adjust stuff accordingly um, in those areas up there. That's the only thing that I, that I can see that might be an issue. Um, other than that, no, I think we're good. And then, of course, if there's any complaints with anything, we'd like to know about them ahead of time so we can try to adjust them. Um, oftentimes, if you have a bad apple in a group, all it takes is just a little speaking to to kind of correct some things before they do get out of hand. We'll have them call you directly. That's fine. <laughs> we'll, we'll put them in your box. <laughs> Uh, no way, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then in a lot of other trail systems that are in place in Vermont, they, they have that. They list the you know, sensitive areas, um, especially you know later in the summer when things get drier and if it's it gets dusty and stuff, they slow the speeds down accordingly so they're not pissing off all the neighbors. Mm -hmm. And we plan to do the same thing because we want to be able to go out and ride. There's no night riding, right? No, um, no right, right. I forget what our exact hours for our riding are, but I think it's like at eight in the morning until dark or something like that. I don't remember, but there's no, no so night driving. Yeah. All right, so just need a motion to accept the, or to approve the Bethel ATV Club's um, trails for 2024. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, all set. Okay. And last but not least on our appointments, we have Gary this evening to talk about um, the fire department advisory board. Yeah, my name is Gary. Um, I'm here to do exactly that, present the idea of the recipe for. Uh, what I consider an advisory board. It, the idea stems a long way back um, from my days at other departments. Um, but first, I would like to thank the board, um, as well as the town manager, for allowing me to um, uh, take on a leadership role inside the fire department because it's these slightly tempestuous times. Um, but uh, I rise tonight once again to discuss the advisory board. And first thing I want to say, because I've heard several rumors to the contrary, is that this is not a an oversight board. 
and has no intention to be an oversight board. I don't support an oversight board, especially in, in a situation as small as the town of Bethel. Uh, nonetheless, I recognize that the uh, it is a town department and it's subject to the needs of the uh, select board um, and the citizens of, of the town. Um, the idea came from when, when I was a volunteer, the idea comes from the fact that there's so many regulations, so much demand on the department itself from budgetary, to HR, to rules and regulations from the federal, the state, the local people. Um, it becomes almost, an, it becomes an impossibility for anyone to keep up with. And I know I put, I think you've got something in the packet for me. Um, that first page lays out some of the responsibilities of the fire chief. Not the department as a whole, because everything falls back to the chief. And you notice it's very expansive. Um, and that is not all inclusive. Um, there's probably 25 or 30 other things that could go on that list. So it becomes a, an enormous job for anybody that's trying to work for a living as a family. Um, it's not a full-time employee. Um, it becomes an issue all the way around. So the idea here was to find a way to reduce some of the load on the chief and on the department itself. And in looking back at the way we did things in a purely 501c3 type of organization, we had our own board. And our board dealt with the budgets, the board dealt with a lot of what you see on the front page. So the chief had a lot more time to address operational needs, uh, development of the department going forward, training, uh, very, some very important things that they've got to have under their belts. Um, at the same time, the chief always had a say in all those other things, budgets, and so on and so forth. So it's not an idea to take away anything from the fire department itself or from the chief of the department. Uh, it's just an, a, an idea, a way to make his life a little easier, or her life a little easier, uh, whichever works. So uh, the idea is laid out. It's, it's for a simple board, three folks, um, two of them being ex-firefighters. Um, that have that left the department under favorable conditions that can provide um, some of the knowledge and some of the feel for the environment the firefighters are working in, especially. Then there's also should be an additional member that's probably a little more business oriented. This can deal with regulations and numbers and so forth, <clears throat> which becomes important. So that's that's the idea in a nutshell, other than what you have there on your thing. Do you want me to go through the whole? Explanation for you. Okay. Um, well, let's see some of my notes, um, and I think I've hit most of the the, the big ones. The. Uh, very helpful was kind of the color flow chart. Yeah. Uh, really helped breaks down of what of what the, the board with the fire department's guidelines would be and then the fire department responsibilities with the board's guidance. So I think that was really nice to kind of show how that flow would work. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it comes down to where the, the, the chief um, is responsible for all of it, but no one person can deal with the entire subset of skill set that is needed for doing all these things. Um, it's quite a list. Mm. And say here, every, every bullet point is, is something else they got to deal with, mm -hmm. from training to whatever. And the list uh, Chris was just referring to is a breakdown. It looks a lot like this. Pass it around. <clears throat> um, the idea here is that the chief is going to be and is only going to be able to deal with about roughly seven of those main items. Uh, that's what we call span of control and emergency services. Um, it's 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 a documented fact that under span of control, the most an individual can be expected to deal with effectively is up to seven different items. So the idea is you get enough people in staff wise to cover seven items, seven items, seven items, and so forth. And that that ensures that one person isn't stuck with the entire list, um, but it also ensures that things get done a little better, a little more effectively. And then the chief has time to go home to his wife or, or uh, a significant other, um, has, has time to do his own job, doesn't have to worry about splitting hairs between calls and uh, what he's doing on wherever he's working at. Um, and it ensures actually in the long run a better 
I think, a better response from the community uh, at large. So uh, in, in this particular case, there's three different, there's actually four different split outs. One is for the chief to do, that's a fire department responsibility that has no color. The second one is the yellow one that shows, that's what the board is responsible for. And then the two other colors go where the chief is responsible, or the fire department, we should say, uh, but they have to do it with input from the board. The other way is that the board is responsible, but they have to do it with input from the chief. So it becomes a, a two-way street. This is the long short of it. Um, and that, that's the only way you can actually, hopefully, assure some cooperation between two groups. It's still a fire department function. The chief still sits on the board. The chief is not divorced from this board. Um, the board, the, but for board matters, the chief has no vote. Um, in personnel matters, the chief would have a vote. So there's some things in there the chief would have a vote on, um, and otherwise. Mm -hmm. so. The thing too is to keep as for people too to keep in mind this this committee is appointed and started. It will have to do an agenda. It will do minutes. It will do so it becomes you know just like the planning commission and a thing where their minutes are kept and things like that. So. Yeah, it falls fully under the open meeting law. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> for the, for the, and so anybody can welcome to show up as to what's going on, comment. I mean, it won't be any different. Than and, and Gary, I had a question. So when I was reading through the structure of the board pieces, so how, how do you feel about um, finding quality members to start the board, I guess? So, you know, I just go back to like when, when we went from a three-person board to a five-person select board, they're like, you're never going to find five people, you know? So do you feel confident that you have individuals that would be willing to be on this board or... So, um, being, being somewhat of an outsider, <laughs> um, uh, but for what I've seen with uh, the willingness of the, the citizens of Bethel to, to come together and a lot of things, I, I don't see there being a, a, an issue. Um, the question might be a, a little better defined as to how well how well I think we can get, bring in an ex firefighter that's not a good condition that wants to come back we always leave for a reason it's too much for you or, uh, but I think that in the long run that's possible because I, I, I think about every other person I need in town is actually an ex-fire there so, you go <laughs> I'm less concerned more probably with that than, yeah than should be, but. right and now I did see in here that um because you I, I'm quite certain that you have had Bethel firefighters that have retired and then maybe moved to a different town. But you're saying in here that you still want them to be a current resident of Bethel. That would be a real good idea. Yeah. Because that's who's going to be more concerned with what we have going on here. Yeah. No. Paul? Yeah. Right, Paul. I'm sorry, Paul. I just saw your chat. Yeah. Um, Gary, can you talk a little bit about the interaction that would take place between the town manager and or select board and this advisory board, if any? Sure. Um, to begin with, the entire idea is still under development. So a lot of, I don't know where to go. It's okay. He can see you. The entire thing is still kind of under development. So um, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay, Paul? Talk to um, the microphone. Yeah, okay. there you go. How's that? Right. How's that? Okay, you shake and say yes. Interaction between the town manager and select. Oh board. yes, okay. Um, yeah, I think it's absolute. Um, the, the, if you notice on the sheet that's in your package, that select board relation is in gray. Yep. And that's because it's both the chief and uh, the, the uh, board itself. Okay. So both of them have a. There's, they, they both would have a function as far as select board relations. Uh, as far as the town manager goes, the town manager is ultimate in arbitration. Uh, that, that position is also the one that will initially appoint some of these members, I hope, um, and will always be there as, a, as our advising hand going forward. Does that, that answer your question? Yes, thank you. So very <clears throat> How long has have people whoever been working on this advisory board? It doesn't seem like it's something that just popped up in the last week or two. 
It seems like it's been thought of for a while and other people were probably involved at the beginning of this. Uh, once again, I, 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 when I, I retired as an assistant chief at Bethel um, about a year and a couple of months ago. And um, I knew from, from talks with David, the, the last chief, um, about what he went through, what he was going through. And I listened to his, the enormity of his complaints about the same issue. Um, so him being overwhelmed and not being able to take care of things. Uh, so when I retired, well, I still needed a hobby. I'm <laughs> just showing up. So I, I put myself to the point of how would I fix the problem? What, there's got to be a solution to this. Because it isn't just a problem inherent at Bethel Park. It's a problem inherent across the U.S. The, the more that they pile on to us with regulations from hazardous materials to, to uh, uh, just general safety concerns to HR material. I mean, it, it becomes this overwhelming thing so that, that even the basic volunteer departments have to deal with anymore. There's no getting around it. The question is, you know, how do we deal with that? So I sat down and I, I uh, examined what I had done, what I've seen other departments do, and so forth. And I realized that with the board that we had, the way that we had structured it, it was much more conducive for me having time off and, and so forth. Now I was running, it amounted to more than one, I think it was one and a half calls a day. So I was already moving all the time. And having a board, which turned out to be more of a staff function because only one of those was actually a firefighter on the board. And I said, on the board, <laughs> uh, it, it, all my budgets were, were taken care of, reporting was taken care of. We didn't have big HR issues because we were in the town department. We did not have. So we, we lost a lot of the payroll concerns and so forth. But we still had the underlying labor laws we had to do with and the opportunity for lawsuits. And if, if you know, well, you know, you, the U.S. is a pretty litigious society, uh, no matter what we do, or no matter how we try to avoid the issue. Here, the environment is a much bigger concern. Uh, in Alabama, it wasn't. Um, but that, that did not negate the fact that we still had an environmental group who had to deal with for spills and so on and so forth. And the regulations that went on from that. So just the wreck we have had out here on the interstate. But this is, this is crazy. The yeah. amount of stuff we're having to get it. And and I've got a actually a letter waiting for me over here at the fire department. I just, just was informed of that uh, wants to talk to us about the spills and stuff we caused on the interstate. Oh, <laughs> so, <clears throat> so I don't know any more than that. Right. Um, but it wasn't leaking when we got there. Right. The response. Right. So you um so you came up with your idea and then you came to see me yep. to see if I was interested and then that's how I thought, you know, I thought it was a good idea and I thought it was, and then I met with Dave Alcetti. And said, hey, you know what? I think this is a good idea. And he thought, yeah. And then I said, all right, go talk to Gary and see what you think. And and uh, you guys met and chatted. And he came back and said, you know what? This is, this is a good idea. It's helpful for people moving forward and, you know, for future, you know, chiefs. There's just so much on one person that I think it makes a good division. Yeah. September, October. Yeah, something like that. Um, and then... I'm sorry. No. Okay. They were um, about in September, October, that year, <coughs> Dave and I had our first basic discussion about it in December before Christmas, because of the holidays. Yeah. Became impossible. And then right after the first thing we and I sat down and had a two, two and a half hour long conversation about it, where we discussed. I showed you the list. I said, Do you agree with this list? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, you know, so it's, yeah, it's, uh, um, I think my letter has arrived. Yeah. So oh. uh, we, we, I feel that if nothing else, if the, if the staff function comes out of this, if they can't lose. But the staff people that are pushed this hard on all the stuff that they have to do inside this don't have, won't have the time to do the firefighting. Right. I mean, if that's what it comes down to. Is how many hours a week are you willing to give to the community? Or, or can give to the community? Exactly. Um, 
right now some of these these guys here do, do you know they're, they're still putting in 15 20 hours wait um, at the fire department as individuals the chief of the department assistant chief of the department um, is putting in you know sometimes i've seen it go as much as 40. since i started as an entertainer it's been 40 hours <laughs> and then it slowed True down um, so it, uh, yeah but there's lots lots that we have to do uh, yeah. we're getting to. So then, the, yes, the long way. There it goes. Yeah. So the next, um, uh, so the fire department has um, started uh, writing and approving um, SOGs, suggested operating guidelines, um, things like that. So at, at your next meeting, um, you will those will be in your packet. So you will see that the chief signed off on them, um, but then you'll kind of just look them over and give them your. Seal of approval. That's right. Bless him. So, yeah. Because I can change this over time. We'll come back to it if there's an issue. But the policy manual has to rewrite the whole thing and take the time. And a lot of departments operate. They used to be SOPs and now they're all SOGs. We do G uh, SOGs, which are guidelines. Yeah. Um, so that there's just a little bit of wiggle room. That's right. Um, in a fire department, it's very tough to be very precise with what your response is going to be or how you're going to deal with this situation or that situation. So you have to the But the thing about the wiggle room is once you've made it, you have to justify it. And if it doesn't work out, then you violated the policy. Yes. So, um, do you think um, three advisory people would be enough, or do you think to handle the? Because it is to me, I was thinking that before it's like Dave must have been just ton of work that he had to do. So, do you think three people would be? I think three initially, and maybe and if, then we'll see how it goes. Okay. Um, I did with five, but one of those was firefighters. Once we get past the establishment phase, then you get some the policies written and, and everything. So once you get moving, you get the machine to have power. Yeah. Um, then you should be right over all of it. I think you can see a decrease in the work over the whole time. So we should also say that um, just, you know, this is your assistant chief, Greg Timmons. So just in case somebody, hello, thank you. So doesn't know, and you've obviously spoken with Greg about this and conversations about that. And um, so I should say, Paul, I'm sorry. Do you have any more questions, Paul? Yeah, I just, I was, I, Gary, I think this is a, a great outline, a good start. I'm sure you'll be tweaking it along the way uh, as you get more into it. Um, would you... Would the board be checking in with the select board, you know, every quarter, you know, a couple of times a year or something, just to give us updates as to what's going on? Yeah, you get their minutes too. I mean, we're it, it's kind of at your service, basically. It's it's a pound department, so yeah, at your service. I don't know a better way to say that. We'll, we'll give you updates every time with me. Uh, initially, it may be twice a month, but I suspect it will be once a month after a certain time. And you'd submit your minutes to Kelly. She puts them on the website, and then she prints them out and puts them in the packet. She posts the agenda, that sort of stuff. So the select board will also see your minutes. But yeah, you could definitely make it. It's, it's just good to check in, you know, once in a while occasionally and kind of let us know if there's anything else that we can do to help move things along. I agree, Paul. That's a great idea. I agree, too. Um, and I'll also say this, and this is in separate away from this particular subject, yeah, yeah. Um, we would love to have select board participation in our meetings, right? Yes. We, uh, okay. we need the first and third Monday we come out here so people, <laughs> people can see who's speaking. Uh, my name is Greg Timmons. I'm the assistant fire chief. We need the first and second. First and third Monday of each month at 6 30. 
So what time? I'm sorry. Six thirty. Six thirty. You know, one thing we talked about doing is um, we haven't done here is occasionally is um, we always hold meetings here, but we could even hold a select board meeting remotely one time. You know, at the fire station, not obviously not on your meeting nights, but we could hold one there too, just to bring more attention to your building at some point if you want to as well. Yeah. So, and we'll make it happen. So, do you do the meeting portion of your meeting? Do you do it first and then you do training? Like, so do you meet from like six thirty to seven and then do training, or just yes. so if someone wanted to come, they would know what not yeah, to be. Yeah. We have yeah. the business meeting the first half hour, and then we'll do training afterwards. Whether it's hose handling, SCBA. Uh, if we can get a hold of a, a vehicle, we'll do vehicle extrication. Okay. Well, thank you. you can see Easy the, stuff. Yeah, uh, right. No. You can see the new rescue. That's right. That's right. Action. Okay. New rescue. That's right. Excellent. That's perfect. Thank you. So I guess uh, you have that. So Gary. Uh, yeah, this is a long term thing. Yeah. That's our main research. No, we don't. So, and I don't know. Yeah, and then of course they would have to come back to here. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think the first step is it forming the advisory board. And I do. Chris made a point, like I think in the breakdown, that normally the chair of this committee would not be the fire chief, but since you're in term. Um, you are you willing to be the chair of this committee? I mean, obviously, they're interim fire chief. I don't know how you would feel about <clears throat> chairing the committee for the first. Well, like I said, it's one of the things we're trying to develop it and keep it going forward. And there's no way I would be that I, I, I would feel like it was proper for me to start advising the outlines of what it is we intend to do <laughs> for the division of labor between the chief and until they're on the board. Right. Um, that, that, that I think is no brand. Okay. Um, so as far as writing policies and these things, they, uh, Greg and I have split up the tasks and I do most of the data and stuff. We mm -hmm. do the policy writing and do these things with that, as well as dealing with the insurance people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the fun stuff. Exactly. And Greg needs to do the really fun stuff with the operation. It goes off the control. So if we do, um, if the select board formed the committee tonight, then you and I could work on advertisement for getting members and groupment at least to try to start the basics. Yeah, of and then the future policy manual for the department itself so, uh, depends great right on whether we go forward to the board or whether we go forward because that becomes an integral part of the application process. Makes sense. All right. So that makes sense. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you guys very much. I really appreciate all that you're doing. It's, it's a lot. And Gary, I did get another email from the insurance company. So, um, <laughs> so we're hopefully we'll know what the state's up to, you know, by the end of the week or something um, or next week. So we'll see. And then, yeah, I can't even believe that. That's right. That's right. All right. So at this point, I just would entertain a motion to approve the the um, fire department advisory board formation. So moved. Second. Third. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Great, there you go. So we'll- Thank you. Yeah, just um, if you, we can work together on an ad that you wanna put out so we can start recruiting, getting, you know, maybe some interested parties um, that fit the bill. Also, pay very close attention to your department. Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. Oh, is it <laughs> Cecil? Is that her jacket? <laughs> it's okay. Mm -hmm. All right.
and we'll move forward to the public comment period. I just want to um, just bring up if anybody didn't sign in on the way in, just make sure you do on the way out that we just have it for the for the minutes. Um, and then just make sure during public comment, uh, even though we may know who everybody is, just make sure that you just um, say your name. And sometimes in this case, you know, probably won't, it, in some cases, it's nice to know where kind of you live. But in this case, I'm, I'm assuming it's Gilead. So um, but uh, it's always just kind of you know, for anybody that might be viewing it later or online, um, kind of helps them. So, so public comment is open. Yes, Brian. Yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit. I talked with you anyway about the uh, the blacktop portion of the other. I want to talk a little bit about the dirt, which too. But what's the? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. You just got to be a little louder. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sometimes they can't hear you online. I just oh, Brian. No, I'm just wondering about the uh, what your solution is to the black top, the holes in the black top. Well, I mean, we know what the we know what the short term is. Patch them, and right. they're gonna they're gonna pound back out again. But yep. What, what can we? When is that due for repaving? Well, we talked. We had this conversation of last year, and we ended up doing what the consensus was, which was budgeting extra money for patching you know, more frequently because it doesn't qualify for a paving grant. It's going to come off from, you know, the town's nickel. What we did talk about briefly, but it didn't fly, was taking it from pavement back to dirt. But obviously some people bought homes on pavement, so they don't want it to be gravel. Um, we do know that once we, when we do go to do Gilead, it's going to be a whole redo like Christian Hill. We're obviously going to have to go in. I, Jeff uh, did culverts and stuff there. So I think the culverts are good in that area, but we're going to have to go in and, you know, reclaim and rebuild the road properly. So I, we didn't have, I think we had talked about maybe five to seven years, I want to say, and um, that we had talked about. So what the compromise was, was that the town would and did budget more money to patch, but you're right. It's, it's in bad shape. Five or seven years the way it is. And, and, and just like you see, you know, like the patches that, that we did out there, um, in the fall, right? I mean, you can clearly drive it today. Some of those areas are still patched. It's just new areas that have blown apart. And in some areas, the places that we patched are gone, you know? So it's kind of a combination. And the challenge is when the pavement is at its beyond life cycle that it's at right now is to get anything to bond to it. You know, you just, you, you, you know, you patch a hole and then the hole bulls out and the hole becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's kind of what we're, what we're, up against on Gilead Road right now. So I, short term is is to continue to patch it. Um, like Therese said, it's not ideal, but you know we've budgeted a little extra money to to do more frequent patching there, which um, you know it looks like it's going to be at least once a year, if not twice. Um, the long term solution is um, is a well. The challenge we have is a majority of paved roads we get some sort of grant funding for, you know, so it's not a hundred percent taxpayer money that, that goes for the road. So like majority of our roads, we, we get class two or three grants um, to, you know, they will do some of, um, you know, 80, 20 money. Um, and, and for whatever reason on Gilead, I wasn't around when it happened, but the town had gotten some funds to do Gilead paving years ago. Um, and they went and paved that road and it and clearly from driving over it the issues that's with it is one the pavement's really old but two you can see a lot of subgrade issues and that's why you're having you you know that's why a lot of the pavement is breaking apart because there is subgrade issues so it, what we suspect is that when they paved the road they didn't do any of the necessary base buildups to be able to put the pavement on it um, so that sub base is kind of inferior so um, budget wise, the, the options at this point, like we said last year would be, there's pretty much, well, we'll call it four options. The first option is just keep pothole patching the thing, which is not, not really a, a, an option, right? The second option is to take it to dirt and leave it dirt. Um, the third option would be to pave over what's existing there. Um, the only thing is we would spend our own money, 100% our own money to pave over what is there 
and you probably won't get more than a few years of life cycle out of it just because of how rough the road is right now. And then, you know, the, and then probably the best option there, if we wanted to have it paved again is either take it to dirt now and then start planning to, to build it, to repave it again over the next few years or wait and do it all in one shot. And, um, so I was helping Teresa out. I mean, you're looking at right now around a little over half a million dollars to take that section of road right back down to dirt, kind of similar to what we did on Christian Hill. So take it down the dirt, um, um, correct any type of drainage issues. I know we've done some drainage work out there, but correct whatever the rest of the drainage issues are, add gravel, much needed gravel to the road and then pave it. Um, so that's around a little over a half a million dollars that we would have to raise to do that. The, the maybe better shorter term would be to take it to dirt. Um, it would be an extra mile and what is a mile and a quarter about mile and a quarter that we'd have to maintain, but at least maintaining a gravel base might be better than trying to pothole patch that thing. Um, and, you know, looking at the market right now, you're probably in the 30 to $35,000 to just take it back down to dirt. Yeah. Um, and then I guess at that point, you know, at least we have, at least we have a little bit more control over the maintenance of that. Um, because it's very challenging because potholes, I mean, we got to go out, we got to patch them. Um, and, you know, we'll say that, you know, our expertise isn't Pot, you know, patching potholes um, or having that type of equipment to do that most of the time. And then, you know, like you were saying, you patch it, falls out, um, you're right back down. At least if you're grading it, you have, you know, we have a grader, we can use a grader, you know, maybe we can do a little more calcium chloride through there or something to get through. Um, but I think the biggest question is, you know, how do we fund it, I guess, is, you know, there's a sizable undertaking. Um, and as we had talked about last year, uh, the list, I guess the town list right now is Sand Hills getting done this year. So we get the water project getting ready to fire back up. We have the funding secured and getting ready to put a bid proposal together for that Sand Hill Road. So that was the next um, priority. And then the next piece, like we said last year, that, that we're looking at funded before we get to a Gilead would be the mile and a half of the Camp Brook Road. So the first mile and a half going up Camp Brook Road, we've probably all seen that. Um, but that would be a road, again, that's a road where we can get match money um, to, to get that work done faster. And then then kind of you're looking at Gilead. So, um, I mean, again, it, it, it's no easy uh, answer. I, I mean, mean unless unless we wanted to go like to a bond vote or something like that, I mean, you're, you're talking a you know, five, six, seven, eight years <clears throat> out to be able to do something like that uh, without like instantly raising the tax rate somehow. Um, so there, I don't know, there's there's really no good answer. Um, I, I think short term, if, if my vote would be to take it to dirt. Um, I, I think it would be easier to maintain. Um, and then, you know, we could do some things like start to add stone base and do some of the drainage improvements. Um, that will cut into um, some of that half a million dollars. And then then if we get to the point where we, we have the ability to fund, to repave that, then we can do that. Because um, I think you're, you know, we could, the plan is to pothole patch out there here in a week or two. The plants will open up next week. Um, but my guess is by the end of summer, you're going to see a majority of those back um, as we did last year. So Yeah, no, I, was, I drove out there today to look at it, and I tr had driven out there Sunday as well. And it's, um, you know, it, 15. <laughs> mechanical wise, it's safe to ride. It's not even safe to I know you're going to patch it. It'll be, it'll be good for a while, but um, you patched it. When did you patch it? Last year, September, August? Yeah, it was something like Early that. fall. I would say before winter it was unacceptable. Yeah. The problem, part of the problem was that it was obviously that some people bought their houses on pavement. So when we tried to fly the idea of maybe going to dirt, it obviously wasn't warmly received, which we understand if you bought a house on pavement. Yeah, but I would think that people would rather have dirt now than they would what we've got now. 
maybe maybe the sentiment has changed. Could find out. Who was against it? I'm not going to listen. I know Dave Algegetti was. <laughs> <'cause I've heard laughs> he kind of, no, he, he actually was. He was I haven't, I haven't heard any. Yeah, I don't think, you know, the first few owners on the road weren't thrilled about it. And um, when we talked about it last time, but certainly can, you know, maybe sending a letter again to those folks saying, hey, this is what we're thinking about. And then seeing how they feel now. And um, then uh, see what the sentiment is. is. All right, go to a road. Yeah, however, some people are very concerned about being a real dust issue if they live right on the road. So there's, yeah, I'm just saying that is a concern. So, but we can you know, certainly could send a letter to the people that'll be affected to see what kind of response we get now. I say, I say do it and skip the letter. <laughs> we'll get yeah. them here. That's, That's Ryan Wright, 802 yeah. 234. <laughs> yeah. And our dirt car isn't any better. Yeah. It was graded. I know they have graded. I know it needs material. I know it was graded. I know all the stumps removed. And, and I did talk to Mr. Sedgwick about Upper Gilead, and I just got quantities there so I can put together a scope of work. But I did talk to Mr. Sedgwick, and he understood that it you know, snowed so that it's pretty wet up there. So he understood that. So I did have communication with him. And like I said, I just got quantities this afternoon. So I'll be working on a scope work. But I'm talking about regular dirt. It does need gravel. I 100% agree. It needs more than that. Well, Do, are you, are you uh, select board, are you familiar with uh, what your duties are under Vermont statute? <laughs> I'm sure at this point. I'm sure you are <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to look it up if I ask you to? Mm -hmm. So Title 19, Chapter 3, you guys should look it up and read it. They all have, they all should have a select word handbook or have had access to one. This is so not does. law. This is no, I know. The select word handbook quotes that. So Town, highway, excuse me, Town yeah. highways are under the supervision of the select board. Mm -hmm. And the very minimum standard is a highway negotiable year-round with a normal pleasure car. And that includes sufficient surface, base, drainage, and width. That's right. That's so class three. The law. That's class three. So how are we breaking the law on that road? Describe the road anytime. So we did. Well, I guess I don't know. I, I don't want to pick a battle with it. But I'm going to. So I mean, we all know that the first mile of that paved road is Paul City. I mean, there's no denying that. But there is no way of filling those potholes if the plants open. So the plants aren't even open yet. But when they do open, we plan on getting those maintained. Now, if it was up to the select board two years ago, we were going to turn that thing to dirt. And everybody didn't want that. So so, so we, we did the wishes of, of, of the, well, I don't know if it was the majority of people on that road, but at least the loudest people on that road <laughs> said, we don't want that to go to dirt. Um, now, we are in these seats as representation from the town's people. And if the majority of people on that road want to go to dirt, I'll raise my hand tonight and put that thing to dirt. You know what I mean? Like, I have no problem, dirt, paved, whatever. I'm a paved guy, I'm like, you know, that's what I do for a living, right? <laughs> Paint it all black, right? But I'm telling you like dirt, like if the paving guy says dirt, then you know something's wrong, right? So. But as far as I was out there today, once you got to the gravel road section, there's nothing wrong with the gravel road section. I drove all the way out through there. The only piece that you couldn't do was Upper Gilead. Once you got there, there's, you know, 400 feet of road that's gone that, we, that we're in the process of fixing. But mm -hmm. you could drive that with a pleasure car from the, from the gravel surface on out. I, I don't see anything wrong with that. You wouldn't a week ago. Uh, we could, a week I, ago today. But you wouldn't on half the roads in the state either. I mean, it's mud season. It's there was 16 mud seasons this winter and I drive, I drive dirt roads all the time, Brian, all the time. When you talk to the mailman, the UPS guy, FedEx guy, the milk truck driver, they said, they, come, they say, don't, don't you guys ever complain about your roads? It's the worst roads we travel on. <laughs> and everybody can see that. I mean, look at the, they're terrible. The dirt, they graded Gilead a week ago today, good. Every single, you can feel it, it's been a week. Every single bump, you can feel it coming back. Within two weeks, it's gonna need grading again. You should see the UPS trucks and FedEx trucks on Sand Hill. Yeah, they, they smoke right along. No, they, no, you mm -hmm. can't. It's it's worse than any dirt road. The uh, paved side of, of Sand Hill is, you can tell when there's a, a FedEx truck or 
the UPS truck. So yeah. I think Chris had told you in an email, or perhaps in person, I'm not sure when you spoke, but that we are, we know that we want to do a gravel road inventory. And so starting that, I've made books of all the roads and what we have done so far and trying to go from, I don't have included the July flood, but we've gone through stuff that we had done, you know, years prior to that, and then start looking at it because we'd calculated this and um, I, the number escapes me in this moment of how much. Um, actually, Ryan Slack and I were calculating at how much per mile it is to, you know, to do a gravel road. And so part of the thing is that we have to go out and look at all the gravel roads and inventory them and look at culverts and this and that. And so, you know, that may be something I'll ask you if you want to participate in is, you know, pick a section and then and go through and and, you know, start. Let's do a, bat, a you know, a road because we know, I mean, Beavine stinks. Ask Gary. And, um, you know, a lot of the roads need a lot of gravel and we're totally agree with that. That's yeah. So we are, uh, I agree with one you. of the select board goals that we had put out this year. We, I wouldn't say we all picked one, but we came up with four. Uh, one of them is to do a gravel roads inventory. So it's, you know, most of the time when towns do road inventories, it's usually paved roads, not gravel roads. So, um, you know, we are doing some research to show that the average paved roads life cycle is about 12 years in Vermont and the average um, dirt roads uh, life cycle is about seven to eight years. So what that means is pretty much, you know, every seven or eight years we need to be putting gravel, right? Now, now I think we all in the room here can <laughs> remember the last time our road was graveled and it probably wasn't seven or eight years ago, right? I mean, we've been we've been regrading the same thing for, you know, a long time. So the idea is to, is to, you know, either divide the town up into quadrants and, you know, and, and figure out which roads are, are, are good, not good, or, or really poor, and then start, start putting our time into that. Cause right now I think, you know, what happens is, you know, the, the road crew gets complaints from everywhere. Right. And they're out there trying to make everybody happy. But while they're driving the greater back and forth in every which direction, they're not really being efficient with it, you know? So I think the goal going forward is to be efficient. Like let's tackle certain areas one year and move to the next year next year so we can lay lay gravel, you know, so that we're grading gravel, not grading nubs and, and, and uh, uh, you know, material that is, it doesn't have stone to it anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and we'll be more than happy. I know I'll be sitting down with, with the road crew and, and anybody that would like to participate in that, um, you know, if, if you have time or something, Brian, I'd be more than happy to have you come along or, or like Teresa oh. saying, you know, we have 70 miles of, of gravel roads and it's yeah. probably and more than two or three people are going to be able to drive. So the, the more yeah. people that we have that maybe can take an inventory of a couple of roads, yeah. the better. And some of it we know, like, um, you know, Jeff rebuilt, you know, Cleveland Brook Road. So we know right away that, Cleveland Book Road, what he did for work, what was done there. We know what was done on Abbott. We know what uh, Jeff did on Whittier and a bunch of other roads. So I, so now that we finally submitted our last FEMA stuff, I think, see what they say now, but um, is taking, you know, like the work that Jeff did or that um, uh, uh, Derek Aldergetti or, or Jeff Towns or whatever, and yep. go in and input that. So we know those roads we don't have to inventory today because we know, you know, they're in good shape. So, but it's, it's the others it's you know so we know it but if you're willing to help we'd love to have you so what, what do you think the best solution well i guess what would be the best temporary short-term solution for gilead road at this point the black top i don't know but yeah, i know really the black top i mean we, we all know that the black top's just you guys i don't know just yeah. professional i'm just bitching about it <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jeff's got an yeah, idea. Jeff. I think what you got to do is square up those patches. Saw cut, cut them. You saw cut them and do large patches. We did that after Irene. I did three or four of them up there, and that pavement is still good. Yeah. So you I mean, think do you mean more like? You're not just talking around the poles. You're no. saying like if, if it's a 50 foot section of well, there's road, there's sections up there that you could take 100 feet of both sides yeah. of the road. That are just you can't miss the potholes. Right. And take that down and patch it, and at least you'd have something. I mean, you you're not just going to shove pavement in these round holes that are all broken up and expect it's going to work. 
Right. It's not going to. You got to square it up. You got to get it to the best best that you can, and then that way you can put a real roller compactor on it and pound the pavement in there. Yeah. And I, I think that that would be the answer, even if it was. I mean, there's places up through there where where there's there's potholes that are eight or nine inches deep, mm -hmm. and most of them, most of those spots are in just in one area. So if you take it and do a large patch there, mm -hmm. I think that's going to help us get through the seven years. Okay. And, and instead, that's instead of taking up the whole asphalt, mm -hmm. which we don't really know what the base is underneath there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have an idea. Yeah, because you've replaced but it a couple isn't, culverts. Yeah. It isn't great. No. So by so. taking it back down to gravel, you might be biting yourself Yeah. that way. Well, that, that, and that does make sense what you're saying because when I drive up there, most of the potholes are like in four sections up there. Like yeah. you can clearly see where there's like a hundred foot section. It's just nothing but potholes. And then the road's okay. And then there's nothing but potholes again. Oh, so. like 50, Some of it's only on one side of the road. Some of it's right in the middle of the road. Mm -hmm. So you get the cars going up through there and they're going like this, trying to miss the potholes. And, yeah. and they're doing it like 50. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Except for me, I'm going 10. Yeah, well, it makes <laughs> sense. Yeah. Is it, I, I mean, it's, it is kill your tires. It's going to kill our tires. So we can get a price on doing yep. that. All right. Well, thank you. But the dirt road needs more, a better maintenance, more maintenance to it. It's poor. It's been poor for 10 years. We haven't had a. Paul, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. Title 19, Chapter 3, look it up. Okay. Not a, not a boss. Title 19, Chapter 3, Vermont Road Statutes. Okay. Read the law. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Anything that's not on the agenda? What? Somebody online? Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm sorry. I thought someone had their hand up and I missed it. Ellie, you're awful quiet. Well, no, I, I, um, I'm on next meeting. Oh, gotcha. Because um, I asked to be on this meeting, but... Um, I said no, we were too busy. To I next. kicked her to the next kicked meeting. Out. Well, it was fine because the guy's not coming to fix the, to do the work at the skate park. Looks like you've got the tie-in stuff coming up here in a week or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but uh, I I think somebody is really out to get us at the skate park. I I've it. been working there for two weeks fixing the fence, fixing the fence. Every week there's a new purple, um, purple thing on on another part of the park. There's oh, paint geez. more of it. Is yeah, paint saying? more of it. There on the concrete. Yeah, on the concrete. Yeah, on the concrete. Mm. And, um, and the wonderful yellow sign that has been up forever. Somebody knocked it off <clears> its <throat> post. They knocked it completely off. I'll let the sheriff's office know. Yeah. Okay. Somebody skateboarders or who's on the No, well I don't think it's I think it's somebody that's I'll yeah. put um, I'll let the sheriff's office know. Trees. Yeah. We made a suggestion yeah. to the rec committee. Yep. Um, because when we were putting in the, the skate rink this winter, we noticed there was uh, spray paint on the concrete. Yep. Maybe reaching out to the school and the art class and have them come up with a mural and do a mural over sure. the whole thing. Yeah. Have the kids engaged in it and make it part of their own. Right. That's a good idea. I mean, we were, yeah, we, I mean, we had a skate park in another town and, and uh, that's what we did is we hired someone to come do murals on yeah, parts of it. Big, um, concrete yeah, it's tempting. You're, you're going to get graffiti. <laughs> but if you make the kids feel that it's their home yeah. and it's their work, yeah. it might take care of it. And you made that suggestion to the rec committee? Yes. Yeah, um, and we talked about it at our oh, meetings. Good. We talked about it at our meetings. And when we were um, addressing the sheriff about the skate park, um, 
we were very disappointed in all the years we've done the ice rink. You know, we haven't had yeah. people, but we drained the rink. And before, between the draining the rink and picking up the, the liner, somebody destroyed our liner with, oh. with um, big rocks and putting holes in our liner. All right, that I'll let them know. Next year, so. All right, all right, so, I'll let them know. Alex. So things are happening over there. And, yep. And yeah. I don't know, I don't know why all of a sudden. I don't either. That's too bad. But I'll um, I'll let them know for sure. Yeah. To ask them to take a look yeah. and um, yeah. and so you guys considered the fire department suggestion about the yes. Good. We, we talked about it in our meetings. Uh, and, um, so yeah. Uh, excellent. And 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 I'll be here uh, next select board for um um on the agenda. Okay. Sounds good. Any further public comment? Maybe you had something? Just an interesting uh, uh, event I had this last week. Uh, I don't know, it was Thursday or Friday. I met with a, uh, uh, by happen chance, a uh, concerned citizen about the Firefly organization up on our hill. Mm -hmm. And Saturday, I'm coming down the road, and there's this group of 15 people in the road. And so I had an idea who they were. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I got a little concern here. I, I introduced myself and what I was. And, uh, well, we want to know what it is. And I said, well, this is a concern. They're working on it. Excellent. Without being asked. That's nice. Or, or I know they weren't asked, but. But you asked them or you brought no, it to their I, attention. I asked them what they're doing. And they, yeah. what they told me they were doing had to do with what. Oh, the what concern the concern was. was. Oh, nice. So that's good. Just something good. That's good. That is positive. That's great. Oh, that's great. Is there any public comment out in uh, on Zoom? There is. Feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand. I don't see any. So hearing none, anything left in person? Public comment. I will add one thing. Yep. They couldn't. They ha they could all over themselves. I have names and addresses and phone numbers and emails for before they let me go. Oh, nice. any more concerns they want to know hmm. okay perfect that's great thank you dave eddie has firefly contact i will share okay perfect thank you all right so we'll close public comment we have actionable items uh we got the creek house diner uh, requesting a first class liquor license and Babe's Bar requests for a special event permit outside consumption permit uh, for the uh, 18th of May from 6 to 12, and an outside consumption permit from 12, uh, 2 p.m. to 12 a.m. on Tuesday through Sundays. Right. So Babe's has a basically it's a special event permit. We used to call it that. Now they call it an outside consumption limited permit so it's the liquor control board making the change so that's why babes has two one is an event and one is their normal outside consumption permit that um we didn't get when we when you approved their other licenses prior so so i'm going to assume when reading that it dices what i'm assuming that the limited is in front of the in the town owned area and the other permit is for their regular property between their building and the railroad well here comes jesse so he'll jesse will jesse will tell you so jesse uh i'm not sure if you heard dave his question was on your out now that you know your liquor control renamed them so now instead of a special event permit it's an outside consumption limited permit so is that going to be just on your in your parking area not the towns it's just going to be on your property in front of your business like normal yeah that's just going to be a section of the front, the parking lot in front, right? Basically, right in front of the door area, like a square, and it'll be, yeah. Okay. It's not then, not going to be anywhere near the town lot. Right, and then Pam and I had a question. Um, your normal outside consumption permit, um, I think it was kind of regular hours. Is that normally two p.m. to twelve a.m. Tuesday through Sunday, or is that right? Yeah, I mean, we're not open till 12 on Tuesday, Wednesday, but 
Thursday, Friday, Saturday we are. So I figured for simplicity, just put two to 12 every day. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure you were, that it was good with you. Yep. Uh, the one event is on the 18th. Yep. Okay. Any further discussion on those? All right. Just need a motion to approve those three permits. So moved. Okay. We'll move it by Paul. Second. Second, Dave. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. And it's that time of year, Killington Stage Race, annual approval for their event on May 26. Um, they usually use the North Road from 10 to noon. Yep. And you have uh, Gary Kessler's letter here. They provide, you know, they work with sheriffs, local police. Uh, they have EMS personnel on the course with ambulances standing by. And they provided you with, you know, all of their information, a map of their course and the proof of insurance and you know, so I've been, I think luckily I'm you're not aware of any issues that you've ever had with the Killington stage race. I think so. Any discussion on that? Okay, just need a motion to approve. So moved. Second by date. Second by Dave, all in favor? Aye. 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 Sure, I'm signing both. It's the same copy, I just okay. made it two-sided for the packet. Thank you. There's the second pro race after the Grand Fondo. Yeah. It was, it was the second uh, Vermont Grand Fondo annual race on Saturday, June 29th. So that's the use of Pleasant Street and Camp Brook Road. And they do the same thing. They have, you know, they work with uh, Green Mountain Flaggers, local sheriff departments, Vermont State Police, and manage, you know, their intersection so they did the same thing provided you the same information that um that uh, Kellington State Grace did except for your proof of insurance which they said they would submit to you um after they received you know approval oh uh, that that was my question I didn't see one in the uh, packet yep no they they'll make it once we uh send them back we, the signed consent form um then we'll have uh then they'll send it to us Okay. Any further discussion on that? Just need a motion to approve. So moved. Dave. Second. Second. Denise, all in favor? Aye. 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 And but not least, oh no, not last. Not last. We get one more after that one. Um, so we had the stipulation agreement. So we um, the adjust adjusted common level of appraisal um, for the state of Vermont that we had challenged. Um, so this will be. It was at what seventy nine. Yeah, I put the information point in your packet. six something, yep. and mm -hmm. now it's up to eighty point two. It doesn't yeah. sound like it's a lot, this is but what it was. 79 yeah yeah so we had challenged so the common level of appraisal as we all know affects the school tax drastically um and um so our common level of appraisal went down nine percent year over year um and it's been going down about an average of eight to nine cents the last two years um, just because the home values have shot up and um what it what it does is try to keep the buying value of the dollar um, um, as current as possible. So being that homes are, are more expensive, now 
now instead of being 100% common level of appraisal where, well, we had dipped into the 79% area. Um, and, and usually 85% triggers like the automatic time to reappraise um, your community, which we, we had started that yeah. before it went below that. <clears throat> um, so we you know, probably maybe some of you have already started to go through that process this year. Uh, but it will be ongoing for a year or so. So we had, um, there were uh, a few things that we had challenged in our common level of appraisal and um, and we were able to get the common level of appraisal to be increased by a half a percent from what, what they had uh, initially sent us. Doesn't sound like it's a lot, half a percent, but what it, it did for the taxpayers, it's about one penny. So we saved one penny on the tax rate by challenging that, so. For the school tax. For the, on the school, yeah. I mean, we'll see it on the school tax kind of thing, so. So assuming that everything, they are going to be, I believe Kurt White was telling me, they're, at the end of this week is when they set their final yield rate with the state. Um, so if the yield falls in order of, of what they think it will be, and now that we got a little bit more of our common level of appraisal, when we had voted on our school budget, it was about a two and a half cent increase. And now that would be probably about a, a one and a half cent increase. So we'll save a little bit. So I just need a motion to authorize myself to sign the CLA. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Just one one goes back to PBNR. And we have the LEMP. So it's the Local Emergency Management Plan Municipal Adoption Form. I know that Kelly had sent it to Gary, I think, to take a look at it. It doesn't change too much each year. A lot of it's just information about, you know, who's chief, who's fire department, who's assistant chief, uh, where our normal air shelters are, hours, that type of thing. So, um, so we have to have it to the um, two rivers before May 1st because it also affects our, um, when, when uh, FEMA comes to figure out part of our, um, oh, I'm trying to complete blank. Now, our share, what we have to pay, this comes into play in that because we want our 12.5% versus 25. So we have to adhere to the rules on time. <laughs> so that's all it is. Okay. So just need a motion. Uh, so you need a motion to authorize yeah, Chris to sign. Okay. Moved by Dave. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And now town manager's report. Um, one of them is that um, so we are looking for someone to um, to take the open spot as the Bethel representative for White River Valley Ambulance. Um, we had put out initial invite um, or request looking for someone that would do um, that they wanted to kind of take over like some of the treasurer's duties and they started working with CompuCount doing payroll and AP. So it made it a little bit easier. But then I received an email today from Sally Roger Roberts, excuse me, of Warva and <clears throat> asking if we'd appointed a new representative yet, which obviously we have not. Um, we're going to change the ad now because they are saying it's not imperative uh, that the Bethel representative fill the treasurer's role. So maybe it'll open it up to a few more people that want to serve that maybe aren't interested in, you know, doing the financial piece. So um, anyways, so what it's, what they're saying is uh, if anyone is interested in the position or there's a select board member that's willing to just attend, they would in love to invite someone from Bethel as a guest of the Warva board president just to um, ensure that Bethel stays informed. So I believe uh, her email came Friday afternoon. I was off and um, she says in here that the, that it was the following uh, agenda for next Tuesday's meeting. So I'm assuming that could be tomorrow. There's also a link to join remotely if needed. So I don't know if a select board member is interested in being a guest of the Warva board president. 
um, to attend the um, the meeting tomorrow night. Um, we'll, we're certainly going to put the ad out again, um, and this time remove the financial requirements from it. So I don't know if Paul or um, any of you guys present would like to attend a WARVA meeting just to get a feel for what's going on. If you do, let me know, <laughs> and uh, I can let Sally know. Otherwise, we'll be changing that. I asked Brian, but he didn't want to serve. So if anybody here wants to serve on the ambulance board, we would love to have you. Is there anybody uh, <laughs> Anybody at the department that Any, might? Any yeah, young firefighters might that might want be? Want to? Attend a night? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I guess at this point, somebody could just go and sit through it and see if it's something they want to do. Yeah, exactly. So, all right. Well, we'll put the ad back out. We've been running it on Facebook, from Porch Forum, that sort of thing. So we'll put it out again and see. Um, obviously, it's an important role to have representation with Warva. So, well, last I knew, we make up what, about 30% yeah, yeah, of pay, their budget. Yeah, so. we do. We're, we're pretty large chunk of it we are so if someone's interested or you know someone that might be interested please have them reach out and certainly put them in touch with warva so they can understand more what they're you know maybe getting themselves into the other thing was a uh, bike ped grant another bike ped grant i talked to um Rita, the first one. I know. Well, <laughs> I know. Unless it's going to the other one. I don't know if we yeah. Can it. Well, that would be like she said. That's a, you know a separate process. But my, we were talking about um, what the bike ped. We could do the small part, small bike ped, which is construction only. And one of the things that came out in the Bethel for All that we talked about was eliminating parking on the laundromat side of the street. We also talked about how, you know, a lot of the truncated domes and the pedestrian crossings are not great. So the small construction grant would allow us money to um, redo the pedestrian crossings, put in proper signage, maybe better, um, you know, lighting or, <clears throat> excuse me, or some sort of pedestrian crossing light if you wanted, as well as replacing that doing some sidewalk where it has become really bad, maybe on Main Street, so we need it to be repaired for ADA compliance. So there is construction money there. There's not engineering money, of course, but some of it um, we already had done. We already had recommendations made uh, by Dubois and King during the Bethel for All process. We also had recommendations made by John Kaplan before he retired from B-Trans about what we could do at the intersections. So it might be worth writing the grant um, to try to you know focus on some of those things, especially if the goal is to get some of this work done, we think that the state will repave in 2026, then if you decide to eliminate parking on one side of the street, that will make it easier for you know once the paving company goes through and then they do the markings and also will allow for us to put in proper signage, maybe you know no parking goes into effect you know sooner rather than later. And, but also definitely um, handicap accessibility and stuff. So I think we should just write the grant and then, you know, like I said, it's not engineering, it's construction. And frankly, we need construction, more construction, less engineering. So that's, uh, I talked to Rita about it. And so we'll move forward with that. Since nobody's opposed, you opposed, Paul? Nope. Okay. I do have a question. Um, I was uh, asked by somebody on Sand Hill if we have any better idea of uh, schedule for what's going to happen over there this year. Well, the um, it looks like uh, Heber is going to mobilize on Monday, April 29th. And I think they were, they'd been up, they were thinking they could start on Crystal, but they're not going to, they're going to start on Sand Hill. But we are still going through like an environmental piece for for the Sanders grant, but we still have to update the water line. So um, that bid will come out for stormwater and paving will come out um, hopefully in May. So, but the water project itself may start on Sand Hill on the 29th. Um, so the other thing is um, Jay McDonald, we've been putting this all over Facebook, uh, Front Porch Forum, and we have two digital signs and Ad in the Herald. Um, that they started today replacing that large culvert near 3610 on Camp Brook Road. Uh, the detour is 107. Um, Rochester is also doing some project, I don't know what, on their side as well. So um, 
just so you know. So that should be done. Hopefully, um, we, the road closure should be just for um, this week. And then we'll have to do a clothing, closing later, excuse me, um, when they pave, but they don't have the paving scheduled. So, but that's the one that we couldn't get FEMA money for. So we moved a structures grant. So this sounds like it'll be back open by the 25th. Yep. That's the deal. Okay. And they've started today. So they're underway. So we apologize in advance for any convenience, but that culvert is in bad shape. So it's getting redone now. So the alternate route would be 107. Okay. So that's it. All right. And we had select board meeting minutes from the 8th. Anything that needed to be amended, or are we good to approve as written? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. And we had some yeah. various minutes. Yeah, a bunch of different <laughs> minutes. The uh, Rec Committee, Energy Committee. Conservation. Yeah, a couple of Energy Committee min minutes, conservation minutes. I would say there's one other thing, but I can't remember. Uh, there was a letter from um, just about Warva, and mm -hmm. then there was another letter about um, from Two Rivers. Pleased to inform you that obviously we've been taking action on our on our municipal on our town plan so it was just them confirming that so and then there was the financials for march and that was it <clears throat> Therese, has got a question for you on the financial stuff. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. All of a sudden, it was really loud. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Paul. That will, that will teach you to nap. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so on the financial side, I didn't really get a chance to look through them. I've just gotten back here a little while ago. Um, you can always look so can, can we talk about um, what happens if a department like the the materials for the road uh, the uh, road crew department um, come in under budget for the year. What happens to the money that's left over that was budgeted um, previously? What happens to that money? So can it the, be rolled over? Can it be moved? Is it, you know, what happens to it? Just for sure. the. Yeah, absolutely. So at the end of June, obviously all their budgets run out at the end of June and any, you know, there's some budgets that may be overspent, some under. And so what happens is any money that's left um, unspent or on the table becomes part of your undesignated fund balance. So, and I'm actually waiting for the hard copy of the audit. Actually, it's done, finalized, and I should Surprised I don't have it in the mail yet. But so it just becomes part of your undesignated fund balance. Yes, what you can do is at a town meeting, you can make it an item on the warning to ask the voters to transfer X amount of dollars. Say, say you want to move $30,000 of the undesignated fund balance towards um, fire apparatus. You know, you would put that on the warning. Uh, so the town's people would vote on it depending how much is in your undesignated fund balance. That's how it gets moved around. And I know in the past, Paul, we've kind of done the opposite, but, you know, typically like even the state does it this way is, you know, if they run into a year where they're under on their budget for winter, then they may invest more into their spring budget. So gravel, uh, those type of maintenances. So there's maybe an opportunity to do more gravel this yeah. uh, spring, early summer than we normally would. Um, just like the opposite, if we would have came out of the winter and we overspent on the winter, then maybe we do a little less on the on the spring maintenance. So maybe maybe this is a good opportunity to put some of that um, money to good use on some of these roads that definitely could use it. 
So does that sh that shouldn't doesn't show up on the financials though? What that the current balance of that undesignated fund? No, nope, it shows it up in the audit. So when we get the hard mm -hmm. copy of the audit, I'll show you where it is. Yeah. Okay. So I don't. I don't know off the top of my head. I, it's been a while since I looked at the draft. So I um, that I approved. So I can't remember what it is. But um. But that might yeah. be something we'd look at around budget time to see if might we might want to do something with some of that. Uh, absolutely, especially um, since we all know it's not a secret that we're unsure of what's going to happen um, with the settlement mm -hmm. of the insurance. So it may be that part of the money on designated fund balance may go towards, you know, depending on the situation, go towards fire apparatus to replace a truck. Or we may be cutting, <clears throat> cutting out some larger sections on Gilead Road, fixing that, right, Brian? Mm -hmm. So. Well, I know we were trying to... <laughs> Read that before bedtime tonight. Is that what you're saying? So, sorry, I, know we go were, ahead. I know we were trying to build that up because we really didn't have we much didn't, of one year, a right. few years ago. Exactly, but you're right. It's a great time to talk about a budget, or maybe sooner once we, you know, find out what our insurance settlement is going to be. And, and and again, it's you know, and we've already started to see that, Paul, with some of the flood repair stuff that we didn't have to um, go into short term borrowing like we would have in the past, and. And right now with interest rates just on short-term borrowing for us being in the five to 6% area, it, it's a significant savings to have cash on hand, um, especially with the interest rates really high. So, but yeah, we'll definitely look at it budget time. That's a great time to think about it, Paul. All right. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. Any other business to come before the board? Hearing none, just need a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right. A second. Dave. Dave, second it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night.